coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. So it was in a condescending way of looking at what I represent, what my value is. But if I had known who I was, what I was, I would have, I would have squared my shoulders to say, this is who I am. You either take it or leave it. Or if you don't love me enough to accept who I am, then there is no relationship. But I didn't know my value. I didn't, I didn't realize what I had or who I was until very late. To, it was a wake-up call for me. Yeah. Welcome visionaries, creators, innovators, entrepreneurs, leaders, and growth seekers of all types to the Passion Struck Podcast. Hi, I'm John Miles, a peak performance coach, multi-industry CEO, Navy veteran, and entrepreneur on a mission to make passion go viral for millions worldwide. And each week I do so by sharing with you an inspirational message and in interviewing high achievers from all walks of life to unlock their secrets and lessons to becoming passion struck. The purpose of our show is to serve you, the listener, by giving you tips, tasks, and activities you can use to achieve peak performance and pursue the passion-driven life you have always wanted to have. Now, let's become passion struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Passion Struck Podcast. And thank you to each and every one of you who come back every week to learn to live better, be better and impact the world. And if you're new to the show or you want to introduce it to friends or family, we have a great way to do it in the form of starter packs. These are collections of your favorite episodes categorized by topic that give any new listeners a great way to find out about the show and everything that we do here. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. And if you haven't been there before, we also have our YouTube channel at John R. Miles, which has over 200 different videos from long form content to short mindset moments that are two to five minutes in length. Please check it out and subscribe at John R. Miles. Today's guest on the Passion Struck podcast is Aluna Osanawa Oluwule, who is a speaker, storyteller, serial entrepreneur, congressional recognition recipient, mentor, and author of several books, including dreams of a patriot, and serve with heart and might. Her mission is to mentor and empower entrepreneurs to become global business leaders and social impact change agents. And today we speak about the power of saying yes to life-changing opportunities and how that has defined Luna's life, how she overcame personal defeat and was able to face her brutal self-awareness the biggest challenges that she sees to facing our brutal self and doing that autopsy, as she calls it, in order to do that self-assessment. Her personal journey from Nigeria to now living in Canada and her advice to those seeking to become an entrepreneur for social change. Thank you for choosing the Passion Struck podcast and choosing me as your host and guide on your journey to unlocking a no regrets life. Now, let the journey begin. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost information to the general public regarding how to unlock an intentional no regrets life. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode. Physical fitness is extremely important to me and forms the very foundation of achieving elite performance and high cognitive abilities which is why I work out daily. And if you're like me, it's hard to find training products that are strong enough to stand up to my gym days, spinning, CrossFit, high intensity interval training, and long hikes. That's why I love 10,000 Apparel and its dedication to continuous improvement. Their name references Malcolm Gladwell's prescription to perfection, and 10,000 is true to that philosophy and how they are making the highest quality, best fitting, and most comfortable training gear that I have ever worn. I especially love their versatile, lightweight, breathable shirts and interval shorts, which feature an optional liner. They actually have a team of 200 athletes testing their gear to ensure their dedication to creating perfect fit, trims, fabric, and design. 10,000 is offering Passion Struck listeners 15% off your purchase. Go to 10,000.cc and enter code PASSIONSTRUCK to receive. 15% off your purchase. That is 
T-E-N-T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D dot C-C and enter code PASSIONSTRUCK. Please consider supporting those who support this show and make it possible and free for our listeners. Now, back to PASSIONSTRUCK. I am so excited about today's sponsor, Athletic Greens, because it is a product that I personally use and love. In fact, Athletic Greens is completely transforming nutrition and helping so many achieve peak performance. This product is so easy to use and make part of your daily morning routine. And that's exactly what happened to me. I just come down every single morning and the first thing I do is take one scoop of their powder, put it in an eight ounce glass of water and it tastes amazing. And the product consists of 75 different vitamins, minerals, immune supporting mushrooms and probiotics. So much here to help your nutrition get the boost that it needs without you having to go to either the store or eat a salad or whatever it may be in our hectic schedules. And with all the stressors that are around us, this is such an easy way to solve your daily nutrition. Now, they are offering my audience a special when you subscribe. Get your one year supply of vitamin D, those five travel packs by going to athleticgreens.com slash passion struck. Welcome to the passion struck podcast. I am so glad to have you on. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure being here. I thank you for having me. Yes. Well, as I was researching you and reached out to have you on the podcast, I think you have had such an interesting life uh, that we're going to get into in this episode. But I thought a great starting point was I just read the the first book by Mark Manson, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. And for me, it was a difficult book to read because I have been putting it to the side actually for well over a year because the title of it kind of signifies everything that is the opposite of what I consider to be passion struck. Um, But as I got through the book, some areas I don't agree with, other areas I, I thought he made some great points. One particular chapter, though, was he thinks we should be saying more no's to life. And to me, I think about it just the opposite. opposite. I think there is the yes virus, but I think oftentimes too many of us are saying no to life-changing opportunities instead of doing the work to get you prepared to say yes and knowing that when they come. And I think that's something that has defined your life. So I thought that would be a great starting point for the audience to get to know you and how you have said yes to opportunities that have defined you. Thank you, John. I think you you rightly mentioned what encapsulates my entire life, which is saying yes to opportunities And this has been, you know, the driving force that has brought me to where I am today. And looking back, I would say the 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 reason I, you know, say yes has been so amazing for me. Uh, Let me just take you back to, I would say, 1997, and that was when I was approached by an elderly. Um, friend and said, would you mind working in the travel industry, you know, and this was me, I had just had a baby in October 1997, my last baby, and um, he said, oh, it's, uh, you're going to be working with the airline, I've never worked with the airline before, although I have a geography background, and I was looking for a job, in another direction and most, I mean, I was looking into the banking industry. I needed stability. I was, I just wanted to build a career in, in the banking industry. And he said, why don't you join then the Swiss Air, um, you know, uh, being one of the uh, ticketing um, managers. And I, I thought to myself, hmm, that sounds interesting. And I said, yes. That, that was the beginning of saying yes to opportunities. Now, going into that industry, was a, I was a newbie. I didn't know anything about the travel industry. But one thing that struck me, I have always been a very curious person. 
curious about my environment, news, information. And I realized that each month, Swiss Air sends us this brochure um, every month about destinations in Switzerland. And I would see the Swiss Alps and every other thing. And I began to think to myself, how do I begin to bring people to Nigeria, you know, and um, uh, package tours and all of that. I didn't really want uh, just to be a booking agent from point A to point. I enjoyed it, I loved it, but I wanted the challenge. I didn't see all of that around me. So fast, fast forward, um, the environment, the working environment became very toxic. And then I said to myself, you know what? I need to start my own business. And that would be in tourism, in travel and tourism. And I said yes to that singular, passion of mine something ignited inside of me and I spoke with my dad I said this is my plan and he said yes okay let's go so that's how I moved from paid employment with a yes that was directed to entrepreneurship starting a travel and tourism um, a travel shop I was driven by um, you know, having to take people from point A to point B. Uh, I, I, I put tour packages together uh, during the West Coast of Africa. And then at some point, I remember that my kids, I just asked them um, a question. Uh, I said, where do you think you're from? And they mentioned one random place that wasn't where they were from. And I said, no, you're not from there. So I began to ask myself, if my kids do not know where they're from, what do I do? I started looking for information. Don't forget, I said, I'd love to find answers to questions. You know, I look for, I do research. So I started looking for books that they could read. I couldn't find. Then I told myself, you know what? Instead of beating myself up, beating the government, saying you don't have any materials, let me be the one to write this history of my state. So I began that journey in October of 2003. Now, I think a month into that, I saw an ad in the newspaper of my state um, advertising for the private sector. They were having an economic summit and they welcomed the private sector to help them to have a discourse, to have you know this two-day conference. And I look at where I go. And when I got to that conference, I was able to tell the government exactly what was happening in the state because I had started a journey to document my state. Unknown to me, the government had noted my name and said, who is this woman telling us what we didn't do? So the January of 2004, I got a call to say um, the government had extended um, an invite to me to appoint me on the board of tourism. And I never worked for the government before. Everybody said, who do you know in government? I said, I don't know anybody. But if the government is calling me, I would say yes. And so that began my journey into the government as, um, you know, as a consultant. And for four years, we were able to, I was able to work with the government um, to, to, to design and develop the tourism policies, um, drive tourism <clears throat> um, investors to the state. And that was a yes that I never regretted. So if, if that journey, so many things, you know, saying yes to that opportunity opened the door for me in the government because at the end of about three years of the, the, the book that I was writing for the state, this book was presented to the state government. And I told the state governor at, um, at a meeting I had with him, I said, I want this books to be books of reading for students in the state. Um, this wasn't just for my kids. I was doing it for other, you know, for the future generations of, of, of my state. I said, I want it to be a book of reading. I want it to, uh, to be launched in the state. And that's how I began my journey as a politician, I, I became an accidental politician because I said yes to uh, a need of my children needing information about their 
the state of origin. I said yes to the government inviting me to be a politician, to be on the board of tourism. And after, after of course, I had, I had published those books. I was given a second term, this time to come into the local government as a councillor, what you call a mayor. Um, I, be, I was given the opportunity to become a deputy mayor, but some way, somehow it was changed and then I became a, a supervisory councillor, one of the executive council um, members. And that was for three years. So during that time, I looked at leadership. I looked at leadership at the federal, I look at leadership at the state level, I looked at leadership at the local government level, and I wasn't impressed, I wasn't happy about where Nigeria was at that time. So close to the end of my, in 2010, I began to pen my thoughts on leadership in Nigeria between 1960 when we had our independence and 2010. And I asked that question, are we still looking for the right leader? Are we still looking for the leader that will take us to that promised land that we want as a nation? And that birthed my second book, which is Dreams of a Patriot. So um, at the end of our tenure, uh, 2010, um, I, I looked at myself and I said, okay, I'm done and dusted with government. I am a creative person. I'm an ideas person. I don't want to go, I don't want to continue in government uh, because I wasn't happy with what I was seeing. So the next thing was to document my political memoir, um, which is the serve with heart and might. So looking at my life has always been saying yes to opportunities and taking that step means doors opening and you never know where that door is gonna lead you to. But I, I, I can tell you, I can confirm to you that those doors saying yes and those doors lead you to a higher calling of who you're meant to be and how you're meant to impact your world. Back to you, John. No, I think that is a wonderful way to explain your journey um, to almost where you are today because um, you are now in Canada, not Nigeria. Yes, yes. Um, but I know through my own career, when I would see high potential performers or people who I thought were high achievers, I would give them opportunities that were way outside of their comfort zone. And it was always very interesting for me to observe what their answer was gonna be when I directed them to that opportunity because about 80% refused to take it on um, because they were kind of in their alley and didn't wanna veer from it. And to me, it was a great way of looking at who was gonna rise above and who was going to stay in their status quo, so, so to speak. So introduction to asking you, why do you think so many people have a difficult time saying yes to these life-changing opportunities and say no to them instead? Uh, thank you, John. I, it also, just to corroborate what you say, it beats my heart when I see people refusing to take on opportunities. And I believe, it has to do with not knowing their potentials. It has to do with not understanding who they are and what they are capable of doing. And also I would say it's about not knowing your authentic self, not being comfortable enough to know your authentic self. Let me give you an example. Why do I say yes to opportunities. It's not because I studied geography, because when you study geography, you know, you're an outdoor person, you have to go out of your comfort zone, you have to learn new places, new things. It's not about that. I could have studied geography and not be um, an outdoor, an outgoing person. It has to do with the individual, how you perceive opportunities or how you perceive challenges. And I think it has to do with our childhood or what we have been exposed to as a child. And I would put myself as a case in point. 
I come from a family of adventurers. My dad was an African immigrant student in the UK in the 60s, in the early 60s. And right from that time, he documented his, his education, his journey in the UK, when he, my mom and himself got married, had my older sister, and he documented several times, you know, they would go to several places in England. And on their way back to Nigeria, on the ship back to Nigeria, in uh, Sierra Leone, and when he, I was born, he also documented. So in that, those videos that I saw, any videos, there were no audio, I was exposed to the outdoor. I saw myself, you know, outdoor, on the field, in the garden. And whenever we travel, we had a very good, um, I come from a privileged background. I say that humbly. And we traveled several times in the, in, you know, in the year, we would go for summer, we would go to different places. And that be, be you know, that formed my personality of taking on challenges because I was exposed to that life on time. I, I couldn't imagine not doing anything, you know, going on a swing, um, sliding down this, running, you know, doing uh, uh, um, all sorts of things in the outdoor, you know. So for me, that formed my personality of taking on challenges. In fact, if it's not a challenge, I don't feel drawn to it. I don't feel like it's for me. So if any opportunity comes, I see it as a challenge and I say, yes, I don't even think about it to say, oh, are you able to do this? Is this for you? I just go. I just take it on because I have had a childhood where my, my father and my mom had exposed us to um, the outdoor to recreation to meeting people so I didn't I don't see any any problem now back to people who say no it's a times born out of fear of oh if I fear what's gonna happen I don't want to mess up I don't want to I, I don't want to I don't want to mess up I don't want anybody to see my 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 frailties I don't want anybody to see my weaknesses but how would you grow if you do not fail? If you just stay in the comfort zone and not do anything and not challenge yourself, you're not growing, you're dying. So, so a lot of times it has to do with understanding how do we unclutter those things that hold people captive, like fear, like what would other people say or the voices in your head that says you're not good enough you you can't do it you're gonna mess up you've done this and that so it's a change of a mindset and to expose such people to the possibilities of what can be if they say yes okay well thank you for that great answer and i wanted to hit on your book uh, serve with heart and might and there were two things I, I wanted to talk about. One was in that book, you talk about overcoming personal defeat. But another thing you talk about is having to do brutal self-assessment. And I loved your terminology for that because the second solo episode I've ever done on Passion Struck was the first thing you've got to do if you're going to change is you've got to examine your brutal reality. And I use the word brutal because sometimes we don't like what we see in the mirror and it's hard to face it. And we want comfort. We don't want that pain. And to get to the other side of living the values that we set for ourselves is oftentimes pain. So for you, what did that uh, wordology of brutal self-assessment mean? And why did you pick those words? <laughs> Thank you. I would say I needed, I had to be brutal to myself to look at those things that I sort of allowed to happen because I was living a life that was pleasing to other people. 
but not to myself. So in order for me to move to where I would be more useful or more uh, impactful, I needed to look at what the weaknesses and what I had done or allowed um, you know, to, to, to happen to me. And one of the things was not being able to value myself enough. When I say value myself enough, I looked at my creativity, my, the opportunities that have been given to me, and I kind of dumb it down because I wanted to please people. So it put me in a position where I couldn't be totally myself because I was conscious of A, maybe my ex-partner saying, you know, you're too much. You know, why is it you? Why do you have to write this book again? Why do you have to be in government? Who needs you in government? Do you know your place? You're supposed to be a woman. You're supposed to be a wife. You're supposed to be this. And there was a constant struggle, a conflict that limited my performance. Struggle in trying to listen to that voice of conformity to societal expectations of being a mother, just stay at home, just, you know, do, don't, 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 don't ruffle anybody's feathers, don't just, you know, rock the boat. And the pull to serve my, my people, to serve humanity with all that I have been given, all the gifts that I have been given, because if I do not pour out of myself to the world, I am dying. It's like having this liquid in a container that is not being poured out. After a while, that liquid, whatever it is, starts smelling. So there was that pool. So I had to look at what were those things that I compromised. Um, you know, I compromised uh, being able to have a voice. And being able to have a voice in a highly patriarchal system environment meant you were, um, you saw, you stuck out like a sore thumb. You are not the normal woman. You're not the normal wife. You're not the normal person that people want to identify with when it comes to, oh, how is your wife? Oh, she's in government. <laughs> she's this, you know. So I, I began to, you know, my voice became Lord, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to listen to those voices or to uh, be the person who I was meant to be and, the and pursue my dreams, pursue my purpose. And to be able to move from that, I needed to assess myself to say, how did I get here? How did I be the person that I am seeing today, um, that was then, you know, and it has to do with what I allowed over a period of many decades. I allowed other people to define me. I allowed the culture, the societal expectations to define me. And what that meant was I didn't leave for myself. I lived for other people. I lived for my ex expectations, his family, what they would say, my own family. They would say, oh, what's, 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 what's with her? You know, can't she just be normal? You know, <laughs> I lived for my kids because I didn't want my kids. I wanted a, a safe home for my kids. So there I was in the midst of all this buhaha and all of that that I lost myself. I tried to find myself, but I couldn't. I did the best that I could. So writing this memoir was a way to write a letter to myself, to tell other women who have fire in their bellies to 
who have dreams and passion to understand the struggle that a woman coming from, you know, the kind of environment that I came from, which is highly patriarchal, um, and it could it could it could be it could be from any 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 environment, how to navigate those challenges. There were so many landmines that I had to overcome. There were so many um, so many problems that I had to overcome. There were very, very challenging times for me that I was battling front, being able to assert myself. I was the only female in an 11 man executive council in, at the local government level. So you can imagine having to speak, having to have my voice recognized as the only female of an 11 man executive council. So whenever I want to talk, we go, oh, she wants to say something again. You know, they look on their faces, oh, she has a brilliant idea. Why did why is she the only one having this brilliant idea? Da, 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 da. And that put a lot of pressure to overperform, to, to, to just drive yourself to be heard. And then I cross over from the, the, the work environment to the home front where I needed, I was battling um, an, a situation of why, I, I, who wears the pants in this, in this relationship? You know, you're, you're, you're a leader, you're a government recognized um, uh, uh, leader, politician. What are you guys doing there? Why do you have to be there? You're the only woman there. If it was meant for women, there would be many women. Why, the, the fact that it's only you means that there's something wrong with you, you know? So I was battling that and I had to be present for my three kids. So I needed to be brutal with myself to understand how I can become a voice for other women who have not, who want to go into politics, but who have fire in their bellies to pursue their passion and still be heard. So those were the things that, you know, I was brutal about. I, I was brutal about having to leave my educate, my, my, my um, postgraduate till 2006. I started it in 2006 because I didn't want to rock the boat. I just wanted to be, um, you know, a mother, a wife and um, cater to my ex-husband's needs and, you know, the kids' needs. So I looked at all the things that I had done that were not in my favor to correct that and also to help other women. Back to you, John. Okay. And I'm going to take it one step further by asking you two different opposing questions. And the first is um, for a person listening who might be facing this brutal self-assessment and going into it, what would be your biggest bit of advice to them? And then on the other side of that, what do you think is the biggest mistake people make? Okay. Yeah. What would be the, bi the biggest advice? I would say the first thing would be for them to value themselves. When you have an understanding of who you are and what you embody, what you bring to the table and what you stand for and being able to stand for that, I think that is the first hurdle. In my, in my opinion, I didn't realize my value. I thought I was just trying to be a better person. I didn't know I had value in who I am, in what I am, and what gifts that I had. I wasn't shown that value of myself. So not being able to value myself meant that I accepted somebody else's perspective or his perception of who I am. You're, you're 
too bold. You're you're you 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 bodacious. You are too outspoken. You're this. You're that. So it was in a condescending way of looking at what I represent, what my value is. But if I had known who I was, what I was, I would have I would have squared my shoulders to say, "This is who I am." You either take it or leave it. Or if you don't love me enough to accept who I am, then there is no relationship. But I didn't know my value. I didn't, I didn't realize what I had or who I was until very late. To It was a wake-up call for me because then I was reading somebody else's script about who I am in a negative way, in a derogatory way that didn't describe who I am. And until I found that power, I had to get my that power back. I had to get my value back to say, this is who I am. I, I, have, I have been um, this person. I have been um, in government. I, I have been at the state government. I have been at the local government. I have done this. That means I bring something to the table. So why would someone else read my values in an opposite um, direction, in an opposite way. So your second question would be what, what is your second question? I lost track of your second the question. The second question would be what mistakes do you see people typically make? I think um, in my own, I would use my, my example. The mistakes we make is we don't spend time with ourselves first. And we, we are often looking for validation. And that's the first mistake that people make. You're looking for validation from other people, be it opposite sex, whatever, whoever, we're looking for validation. So in looking for validation, you leave the most important person, which is you. So that, that's the mistake a lot of people make. And that's the mistake that I made. I was looking for validation. And I didn't, I didn't get that validation. What I got was a bashing of this is, this is who you are. I don't want this kind of person. So if you do not know or spend time with yourself, that is the, that is the letter I'm going to write to my younger self. Spend time with yourself to know who you are. So you're not looking for validation, you're looking for someone or to compliment both of you. You're not looking for the person to validate you because you already validated yourself by knowing yourself, by being authentic with yourself. You know who you are. Right now, I do not have any apologies. Um, I am a passionate woman. I have passion, I love the outdoor, I'm, I'm bodacious, I say yes to opportunities, I, I can fail in taking those opportunities, but I will get myself back, it would grow, I would grow from it, I will learn from it, but that does not mean that I would wait for you to validate me to say you, this is good, I would know this is what I can do, this is who I am, and if I want to have a relationship, I'm going to bring that to the table. My, these are my values. And so if someone that comes in contact with it's either he, he, whoever values you, respects you for who you are, rather than you looking to that person to validate you. So the mistake we make is oftentimes we don't spend time with ourselves a lot of times people you don't know have come to be in tune at times i i i i, I surprise myself when i say oh is that you olu oh my god okay so i'm learning the you the me rather that i didn't know for so many years so uh, i hope that answers your question no i think it was a a, a very great answer and 
I think it was spot on. I, I would say that for me, another mistake people make is they don't accept the problems in their life. And instead they want to pass on, well, I got fired from that job because I had a terrible boss or this relationship didn't work because of the person I was with, or I didn't run the race I needed to because of the weather. I mean, whatever it is, I think one of the most difficult things for me to do as I spent more and more time with my own thoughts was accepting that I am in reality, the person who creates the problem and the only person who can fix the problems, especially if it's a problem that keeps repeating itself. Because there's that old saying, if the problem happens one time, okay, yeah. but if it happens second and third, I mean, you're oh, the problem. <laughs> you're the problem. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think that's another thing is people don't want to confront their problems and they just want to pass them off because yeah. oftentimes it's hard to to want to admit that the way you're living I, I things is. Yeah. I want to I want to stay on that a bit. Um, when you say people don't want to own, uh, you know, uh, at times when, I mean, in all that I'm saying, I'm not, I'm, uh, projecting that I'm a saint. I would say one of the problems that I had was in terms of finances, how to handle finances. And I looked at that aspect of my life that how I, I don't just get it. I don't just understand. I just don't, don't know, but I had to peel back to have a self assessment and peeling back the, the, you know, the, the, in my life, I looked at my childhood. My dad was the sole provider. So I literally, you know, grew up in a, in a, in a home where I didn't have to look for money, money. We just, you needed shoes. It was there. We needed to travel. We just went on the plane. We need to go in the car. I didn't know where money came from, food, everything, toys, that, clothing. Mm. So I never worked one day in my life. So I saw that pattern. I didn't know where money came from. So I didn't understand how to be financially um, independent. I didn't know what that meant or savings because that was there. And I saw my mother, she was a stay at home mom who she didn't own any property. My dad owned loads of loads and loads of properties, you know, everywhere and anywhere. And I didn't see my, I mean, my mom uh, talking to me or um, teaching us about savings or even my dad, he was always about education. So I never worked. It was, it was unheard of. I, I mean, I remember a time I told my dad I wanted to um, have a, a, a holiday job um, at his um, office at that time. And he said, no, 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 no. No child of mine is working, you know. So that was end of the story. He said, what do you want? This is this. So when I finished um, university, he bought me a car. So I didn't know where that came from. I didn't, he just traveled to Belgium. Where he went the UK on his way back in Belgium he bought a car and said guess what I bought you a car so right from my father's house I went into marriage so I didn't understand finances I was pretty messed up with financial um you know accountability I didn't know you know this and that and that was a problem for me and I had a partner who had the opposite of my experience. He came from a humble background. So finances, money, saving was a biggie, was an issue. And for me, I was just bumbling off in life, you know, thinking money would just surface and all of that. So that was one of the things we had a huge conflict. I didn't understand what my problem was at that time because I came from a background that I didn't have that education about money. So um, through the years, I couldn't, I couldn't get a hang of it. So when I came to Canada, the very first thing that I did, because before I came to Canada, I did what you call an autopsy of three decades of my life. I did an autopsy, not an audit, it's an autopsy. <laughs> 
of what had happened. And on the right hand side, what was going good. And on the left hand side, what I had done wrong. And one of the things that two things, two or three things came up, the financial, um, uh, my financial problems of not understanding money and all of that, and two, wrong relationships. So I had to tackle the first one. And that with, I went into being a financial, a, a licensed financial advisor. So I had to learn, I came from zero understanding of money to now understanding how insurance works, investment, uh, critical, all the, the whole nine yards of, of money, the financial industry in Canada. And I got me a license to say, this is it. So I needed to, 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 to the problem, but it wasn't a problem that I, 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 it was like my problem. I, it was a generational thing. I was, I, it wasn't my fault. I just grew into it and I, I didn't see it until I got out of it. Then I began to see what was the problem. And then on the other side of wrong relationships, I began to look at the relationships that I had that didn't value me. And I decided to shut them down one by one and leave the ones that were healthy. And that was the only way because those wrong relationships led to some of the decisions that I took in times past that made me fail at this venture or that venture. So I, I began to close all those relationships and sift through them to leave just a, a few on, on my fingers, you know, that were positive, that would move me to the next level and then begin to cultivate better relationships that would move me to um, a better, a, to be a better expression of myself, a better person. So those are the things that I wanted to just bring out when, you know, when you're, when you have to do um, an audit of your, of yourself. Yes, I actually call it uh, conducting uh, the mosquito principle, which is a mosquito audit, because these pesky things are all around us, yet we often don't realize they're there until they bite us. And I think bad influences in our life are kind of the same way. Sometimes we accept them because they've been there for a while. Other times they sneak up uh, when we least expect it. But until you do that audit and pick those right influences, you're going to stay stuck. Um, and I think one of the positive influences we both met, uh, which is the reason you're here on the show, uh, was a previous guest of mine, Amy Malin, um, who I know is a friend of, of both of ours, but I wanted mm -hmm. to use that because she's a social entrepreneur. And I know for you, um, the whole idea of social entrepreneurship, especially for women, uh, is a really big thing. So I just wanted to get your ideas on why it's so important to make social impact. Thank you so much. Um, I think it stems from what we all have experienced um, that makes us to want to impact our world better. When I was growing up, I didn't have, I had an older sister, but she left for England when I was 10. So I didn't have an older sister in the house. So I always was looking out, you know, for an older person. Um, and I didn't get. And then when I got into entrepreneurship, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have somebody to guide me. I didn't have any support. In fact, there was no safe environment where I could, I could get the support that I needed in terms of um, problems that I was encountering in, in, in business. How do you do this? How do you navigate this? And then when I got into politics, there was nothing, there was no um, mentor to guide. There was no role model that I had in my circle that I could lean on. So going through that journey, I have built uh, uh, over two decades of experience in navigating and doing stuff for myself that I said to myself that no woman needs to go through what I went through 
So I became the person that I was looking for by going into um, entrepreneurship with a view to impact, not only, you know, uh, uh, make profit and, and, and all of that, but also to become who I was looking for, to become a role model, a mentor, a guide to other women entrepreneurs, because I know the struggle. So, so for me, that passion to support women entrepreneurs is born and to, to support them, to be the voice, to help amplify their voices is born out of looking for the person I never had. So everything that I did or I'm doing right now is on social entrepreneurship, which is in you know, supporting women entrepreneurs, um, amplifying their voices and being the person that I was looking for at the onset of my journey. So that's my, that's the whole, that's the whole philosophy. That's the, the whole mandate that I have to help as many women to reach for their dreams, to give a voice to them, you know, either they've been underrepresented, underserved, unheard, to give a voice to them and to be that that shoulder that they can they can they can stand on to be the best expression of themselves because so much lies in a woman so many potentials are in a woman that if she's not in the right environment where the most where the most um negatively impacted species if we have a wrong um you know uh influencer in our lives or role model. So being that woman and creating a space and an environment or a community for women entrepreneurs is my lifelong dream because I want to be the person to them who I was looking for all these years. Okay. And I think that's a great segue for, I always like to give the guest a chance to tell the listener where they can find more information about themselves at. So I think this is a great segue into that. Okay. <laughs> All right. So right now I am running a storytelling series for entrepreneurs, founders, venture capitalists, um, angel investors, startups, creating that community of exchange of um, ideas, um, experience. And you can find um, you know, me on LinkedIn, Oluneye Oluwole, or you can find on my um, website, oluneyespeaks.com. And um, we're going to the last season, the last episode of the storytelling series, where we're actually transitioning into something, um, you know, bigger for next year, for season two. So I would say, but if you, if, if you connect with me on LinkedIn or on my website, um, my go-to is my LinkedIn. Um, then you would have more information uh, regarding that community building for, for entrepreneurs. Okay, and I'll make sure all that is in the show notes and I'll also put uh, your books in the show notes as well so people yeah. can get access to them. So I am now at the part of the interview where normally I ask four or five fun questions. I'm gonna do that for four of them, but on one of them, um, it, it's a little bit more of a serious question, and that is, um, I know you love your country, Nigeria, uh, and that just speaks with the way that you talk about it through your heart, and you were there through both, both times of military rule, and for those who don't know it, about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, it became the largest democracy in Africa because Nigeria is the largest country and has the largest economy. Mm. Now that you're living in Canada and you're seeing some of the things that are happening in the United States, et cetera, mm -hmm. what are some of the biggest or maybe the biggest lesson you learned during your time in Nigeria that could be applied mm -hmm. to kind of the political unrest that we're having here in the United States? I would say it 
it has to it has to be on leadership. Leadership. Um, the question, the, my greatest what? What did you say? The great the greatest um, lesson? Yes. I would say it's um, it's a leadership when leaders stop being servant leaders. By that, I mean leadership is for the people, by the people, and uh, they, they forget the most important, and which is to serve people, which is to serve, um, you know, uh, whoever elected them into, into the office. So when there is a disconnect between um, what leadership is meant to be and what they kind of see as the status quo. Because one of the things that happens with leaders is, you know, they forget the why that they were elected, the why. And that is taken over by a lot of things, you know, um, this is how it's done. This is the status quo just, and for the fear of making a change. So I see that as, you know, um, one of the problems in, in, my, in my native country, Nigeria, um, the leaders have left the duty of being a leader, being a servant leader to pursuing um, different agenda that doesn't, that doesn't um, translate to, uh, you know, the good of the, the people. So I see that as um, a problem, I and mean, it, it it can be it can be it 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 can it can be in any country. So when I wrote "Serve with Heart and Mind," it was taken from our anthem, you know, um, Nigeria's anthem, to serve with heart and mind. When a leader stops serving with his heart and with his mind, you know, he it, it, it what you get is anarchy what you get is what we're seeing all over the world because as a leader you must have a heart to to serve people and you must have the strength to be able to carry the burden of that office and do it selflessly to the best of your ability so if leaders who are being called are not answering to that call then there's going to be chaos and all, all sorts of uh, problems that we see yeah, I think that's a great point. If you're not uh, really in it for your constituents, which is the whole reason that you're elected, is to mm -hmm. represent them and their desires, and it becomes more about your party's desires or your personal desires, mm -hmm. it's never going to be a winning solution. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to ask you four quick questions. fun questions now. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one is, if you could meet a person you've nev never met before, dead or alive, who would that person be? Hmm. I'd say it would be Maya Angelou. Okay. And why would I say it's Maya? She represents, she's an epitome of wisdom, of um, a woman who's gone through a lot of struggle to be who she was and how she impacted not only her home state of Arkansas, but how her impact reverberated all over the world to become um, a world leader in her own right, in, in arts, in, in spoken word, in, in music, in anything, and the way she carried herself with the knowledge of who she she was so she's someone to me that I would love to meet to just ask her those questions how did you be how did you get into your own how did you you know get into um you know the poems and when she when she when she does those you know performances well her poetry you know, says, I still arise, I rise. I just wanna, I just wanna hear that voice and and ask her how she how she came to to be who she was. Okay. So that's my answer. 
That's a great answer. Um, so next question is, you and I both share a passion for music. It was mm -hmm. something I hope we could have dived more into, but we didn't get a chance. But okay. what, has been, what has been your biggest musical influence? I would say my, oh, whew, where, do I, where do I start from in terms of music? Because uh, my dad introduced us to different genres of music. Um, R&B, soul, funk, Afrobeats. I'm trying to get you the history of my musical journey. And then um, I went into um, spiritual, um, you know, well, hymnals because we were in, we're, I was born in church, born and raised in church. And um, so if I look at, if I look at my, my, my musical journey, I would say right now, uh, having gone through um, the different genres of music, my go-to is the uh, gospel music now, because that's where I would say my, 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 my creative zone, where I have a connection with my spirituality. And that for me is my biggest passion right now, that the kind of music that I wanna produce, like I've written two songs now. I haven't, I haven't done my album, so it's still in under rap. So, and the genre is in, is in the gospel, um, is, a, is a gospel genre. So, but I have, I have lived through Afrobeat, I've lived through um, r and I've lived through rock, I've lived through everything, reggae, name it, my dad did everything. Um, even, you know, um, Christmas carols. But um, I would say for me, what strikes a chord inside of me is the gospel music because I'm very, I'm a spiritual person. Okay, and then one last question. Um, if you had the opportunity to be one of the first astronauts to go on the mission to Mars, and you were told that you could put one rule or law in place, what would it be? Whew. It would be to educate and put in place a policy that talks about financial education for women, for girls, right from K class. That would be something that I want to, that I would want to, you know, um, see because when a girl is empowered uh, financially, has understanding, is one of those things that, that would, um, that is the cause of, um, you know, uh, gender-based violence, uh, gender, you know, uh, inequality. I think, um, that would be a policy that would really, really help women to be empowered right from the get-go. So having financial education from baby class, just to know what savings means, what yes. investment means and all of that, that, that would make a whole lot of difference and uh, a stop dependence on, on um, you know, someone else for your financial um, life. Okay, well, Lena, thank you so much for being on the show today. I, I very thank much you. enjoyed our conversation. And thank, thank you, you for being so vulnerable and opening up with the audience. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, John. What a great interview with Aluna. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And now I want to introduce William, our fan of the week from the United Kingdom, who wrote this review. Awesome podcast. Just started listening. I'm on episode 12 and I just can't get enough. William, thank you so much for taking the time to give us a rating. We appreciate those so much, and they're helping us on this mission to help passion go viral to so many around the world and help people regain the passion that was once in their life. And during today's episode, we discussed a couple other past episodes of the podcast, including episode 79 with Amy Malin, a friend of Aluna's, and also my solo episode number three, on how to maintain forward momentum, even when you're facing the largest adversity. And if you'd like to see me interview a specific guest, please reach out to me 
on Instagram at John R. Miles or also on LinkedIn at John Miles. Thank you again for taking the time to join us here today. And please check out hashinstruct.com where you can get the full show notes and also books that we mentioned in today's podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. The purpose of our show is to make passion go viral. And we do that by sharing with you the knowledge and skills that you need to unlock your hidden potential. If you want to hear more, please subscribe to the Passion Struck podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at. And if you absolutely love this episode, we'd appreciate a five-star rating on iTunes and you sharing it with three of your most growth-minded friends so they can post it as well to their social accounts and help us grow our Passion Struck community. If you'd like to learn more about the show and our mission, you can go to passionstruck.com where you can sign up for our, our newsletter, look at our tools, and also download the show notes for today's episode. Additionally, you can listen to us every Tuesday and Friday for even more inspiring content. And remember, make a choice, work hard, and step into your sharp edges. Thank you again for joining us. 